This video is brought to you by viewers like you. Thanks for letting me do this for so long. I know I'm making Zelda Month as a way of celebrating the release of Tears of the Kingdom, but you'll be surprised to hear just how much of May has been spent not playing that game. Yeah, it's a Zelda month that includes every other game in that franchise too, but seeing as though we're at the end of May and people have had a couple of weeks to play Tears of the Kingdom, I should dedicate a bit of time to talk about the best and worst dungeons in the game. Zelda had a bit of a break from dungeons, with Breath of the Wild opting for Divine Beasts instead, but Tears of the Kingdom came roaring back with four exciting dungeons and two smaller areas that I'm going to count as dungeons for the sake of giving me a little bit more to talk about. Obviously I'm going to spoil quite a bit, but nothing beyond the last dungeon in the game, which helpfully isn't really linked to the end of the game all that much. Are the dungeons good after all this time? Yeah, they're alright. Never take them away again, please. So, I don't know if this will end up being a controversial choice to start with as the worst dungeon in Tears of the Kingdom, or more like the least good dungeon since they're all pretty good, but I didn't think Hyrule Castle was as good as it could have been. Listen, there's a lot to like here, it's a completely different style of Hyrule Castle to the one that we had in Breath of the Wild, since it's not as occupied by monsters as before, and, you know, half of it is floating off the ground, but sadly, the comparisons to the last game's version don't really help it. I know Hyrule Castle has some major story significance to it, and it's where you get to see Ganondorf for the first time since the opening, but I can't help but feel like this place was way cooler when it was swarming with Lynels and Guardians. Never thought I'd miss being sniped from miles out by laser beams. Tears of the Kingdom decides to replace the siege feeling of the previous Hyrule Castle with running around after obviously fake Zelda until you've had the kind of tour of the castle that people would probably pay a lot of money for. It's not particularly challenging, it's just kind of annoying to have to follow Zelda all over the place in a way that is only really delaying the inevitable obvious reveal. Honestly, the best part of Hyrule Castle was the fight with multiple Phantom Ganons since it fucked up my shit when I fought them and it forced me to really pay attention to how I was fighting these things. I was worried that having four extra party members would make a lot of the combat in Tears of the Kingdom too easy, but facing down five Phantom Ganons on your own does not sound like my idea of fun, so thank merciful Christ for my entourage. I'd probably still be at this fight if it wasn't for them. The best way to describe the Wind Temple is that it's a dungeon that gets worse as it goes along. Again, I don't think any of these dungeons are bad, so it's all on a sliding scale, but when you start so incredibly strong, it's a tall order to keep those standards going the whole time. The approach to the Wind Temple is probably the best in the whole game. It's a thematically appropriate climb up into the clouds via sky islands and airships that goes on for so long and goes so high that I remember looking around after 20 minutes of climbing and realising that I was still miles away from the Thunderhead that houses the Wind Temple. By the time you drop into the Thunderhead from above, you're at one of the highest altitudes you can be at in Tears of the Kingdom and damn, this is before the dungeon? What kind of spectacular adventures await below, I wonder? Well, the Wind Temple proper is kinda good. It's got your expected heaping of wind puzzles coupled with ice stuff since someone's brewing a blizzard in the middle of the airship, and I would say that while some of the puzzles are a little basic, the environment in general does make good use of Tullin's ability and gives you a lot of freedom with how you move around the airship. This decent experience is let down substantially by the boss of the Wind Temple, since while large parts of this dungeon feel like they were designed to be a gentle introduction into how this game would handle dungeons, Cole Garrett is just straight up not designed to be anything but the first boss fight in the game. It looks fucking sweet, and a giant flying ice worm is the perfect mix of the two themes, but with a constant updraft and obvious weak spots, this is a very easy fight. If you come here with any amount of investment into stamina, it's laughably easy, and Cole Garrett is actually the only fight in the game that I beat first time. Go here first, and you're probably fine. Go here any time after that, and it might not work for you. Hey guys, real quick, my channel has been approved for YouTube memberships now, so if you fancy supporting my channel more directly, you can become a member for as little as £1 a month and gain access to some nifty perks, as well as being featured on my channel page. Hit the join button below this video if that sounds cool to you. Thank you, and let's get back to the video. I ain't gonna lie, I was very worried before I got to the Water Temple. The Zoras were the last area that I went to, and given how capable the previous dungeons had proven, I was praying that Nintendo wouldn't drop the ball with a dungeon theme that comes with a history of infamy. 
Across Zelda as a whole, you are much more likely to find a frustratingly slow water dungeon that gets too bogged down with convoluted water puzzles than anything worth replaying more than once, and so, justifiably so. I was very concerned that the Zoras were hiding this horribly confusing water dungeon just waiting to ruin the positive vibe that every other dungeon was giving off. Well, I shouldn't have worried, since the last two mainline Zelda games have worked hard to shake off some of the more obnoxious wrinkles in this franchise, and sure enough, bad water temples are a thing of the past. Even so, Tears of the Kingdom's water temple is a bit odd. Every other dungeon in this game is laid out at least somewhat like what you'd expect from a traditional Zelda dungeon, but the water temple isn't anything like that. It's very open, and I don't think there's a single door that you can walk through apart from the barriers keeping you out of the gears that activate the faucets. It gives the water temple this super strange vibe where you can see literally nearly every puzzle and enemy that this dungeon has to offer from one vantage point. And if these puzzles had simple solutions, we'd be done with the water temple in no time at all. Don't get me wrong, it's not the longest dungeon in the world and only has four things for you to activate instead of the usual five for some reason, but I can't tell you how happy it makes me that this dungeon has water puzzles in it that aren't just fucking around with the water level. That one puzzle where you need to power a gate so you can activate a faucet, so you get the water wheel working, but the current doesn't go all the way. You need something to fill this gap here, but I don't see any metal blocks around, so I need something else that conducts electricity. <gasps> yeah, that was a fun moment for me. As was the boss, since the Muktorok is definitely the strangest and funniest fight I've seen in a Zelda game for a long time. Look at his little legs! He thinks he's people. On the face of it, the Spirit Temple shouldn't be on here. The temple itself is one room big, and even then, that one room houses a boss fight which rewards you with a heart container straight after and clears a path to the end of a very short dungeon. Along with Hyrule Castle, this is the other dungeon that I'm being very generous with by calling it a dungeon. And certainly, when you compare Tears of the Kingdom Spirit Temple to Ocarina of Time's equivalent, yeah, it's not flattering. However, since the Spirit Temple is pretty much a boss fight that rounds off the larger quest of finding the Construct Factory and using it to piece together this awesome mech, I don't think it's too much of a stretch to include basically everything you do in the depths as part of this quest. And this is where the Spirit Temple suddenly gets really good. Ah, not the Spirit Temple exactly, but you know what I mean. The Construct Factory is this neat little section where you need to go to these four depots and pick up two robot arms and two robot legs so you can assemble this mech. The depots themselves are short sections that make inventive use of attaching different kinds of propulsion to the encased body part and guiding it outside, and any puzzle that requires me to strap something to a rocket has me on board. Once built, the Construct Mecha thing can be ridden by Link and confuse weapons and Zonai parts onto its arms and body, which easily turns it into this beefy powerhouse that staggers every enemy you find on your way to the Spirit Temple. Once there, you partake in one of the best boss fights in the game. A one-on-one -on -one fight with a corrupted construct in a boxing ring for some reason, where you can use whatever parts you find in the ring to knock the construct into the electrified ropes. So goofy, and yet kind of challenging, because I came here with not a lot of hearts, and damn, he hits hard. Not what I expected from the last dungeon in the game, but it's definitely something I'm going to remember for a while to come. The Fire Temple had my attention as soon as I realised it was entirely located in the depths. It's a nifty idea to avoid setting it inside Death Mountain, and an even niftier one to reach it by diving into the mouth of the inactive volcano. Like the most counterintuitive skydive based on how Death Mountain looked in the last game. But the Fire Temple has more tricks than just its location up its sleeve. This is the Minecart Dungeon, which comes with a host of knock-on effects like how much time you spend attaching things to vehicles, or how absolutely huge this dungeon is, and that second bit can be a bit of a sticking point. It can be a little confusing working out where to go at what point in the Fire Temple and how all the tracks link together, but you can climb most of the walls in here, so it doesn't really matter all that much. And if this is the price I have to pay to screw around with minecarts the whole time, I am more than happy to oblige. While general navigation can be a little challenging at times, I didn't mind it too much since you're spending most of your time racing around in minecarts, with the Fire Temple able to go the extra mile by putting them to use in some very nifty puzzles. A lot of this dungeon is just navigating the environment via minecarts, but it never wore me down like you'd perhaps expect it to. Especially since there's an entertaining boss fight waiting at the end of all of this, and a long-awaited reunion with some kind of variation of Goma. 
this time with a rock exterior that can only be damaged by sending Yunoba for a ride around the boss arena. The second phase is a little luck based since you'll probably have to aim away from Goma to actually hit the spider, crab, rock monster thing, but that's my only real issue with this. We sure are a long way removed from Breath of the Wild having four different flavours of Blight Ganons, aren't we? If you can work it out in your head, you'll know that I've left the Lightning Temple to occupy the top spot as the best dungeon in Tears of the Kingdom, which is appropriate since I'd say that Varnaboris was the best Divine Beast in Breath of the Wild. I went to the Gerudos first to see if, um, Lightning could strike twice. Oof, who wrote this? But sure enough, Nintendo seemed to save their best ideas for seemingly the most challenging region in Hyrule. One of the main things working in the Lightning Temple's favour is how, with the exception of Hyrule Castle, it's the only dungeon found on the surface, and even better than that, you do some classic Legend of Zelda puzzle solving, complete with a big old Triforce shape in the desert, to have the temple rise out of the sand. I don't know, I just really like a dungeon that you have to physically reveal the location of. I was starting to worry that these games have forgotten how to do that. The Lightning Temple is effectively a large pyramid filled with electric and light puzzles, and I think it's the light puzzles that go a long way towards endearing this dungeon to me. It's actually quite dimly lit in here, so it gives off a lot of secret temple vibes that hasn't been disturbed in centuries, which obviously works perfect with a desert-based dungeon. The light puzzles aren't anything too mind-melting, but it's something I've wanted to see explore with this new Zelda engine for a while, and the Lightning Temple absolutely doesn't let the side down. It's a large dungeon with lots of rooms to explore, much like the Fire Temple, but it's mostly vertical, and I've always loved a temple that is able to use its verticality to heighten the tension and anticipation as you climb higher. If anything, the Lightning Temple spoiled me a tad, since as my first dungeon I was presuming that they'd all come with extra surprises like having to fight the boss for a spell before even starting the dungeon, but nah, this is just a cool thing reserved for the best dungeon in the game. The Queen Gibdo is a challenging fight that took me a while, especially since I literally had starting hearts at this point, but once you get into a rhythm it's a really enjoyable battle with only a little bit of enemy spam in the second stage. When that light drops, it's all over for these clowns. So yeah, that's all the dungeons in Tears of the Kingdom. Do you agree or did you really like Hyrule Castle? Let me know in a comment down below. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you leave a like and hit subscribe for more and hit that bell for notifications of every new upload. If you need something else to watch right now, I talked about the scariest Zelda moments last week and I also want to thank my top supporters on Patreon, including Lima Pro, Blue Caterade and Devon Hutt. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Take care.